Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. My name is Peter, and I help direct the events here at Strand. Uh, for a little bit of history, Strand was founded in 1927 by the Bass family over on what was then 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Astor Place to Union Square, the Book Row gradually dwindled until after 91 years, Strand is the sole survivor, still run by the Bass family, and still housing new and used books. Thank you. I'll, I'll pass that along to the store. Tonight we are very excited to welcome back Bill McKibben to discuss Falter. Has the human game begun to play itself out? Bill is a committed and distinguished activist having co-founded the environmental organization 350.org and helped to organize efforts like the People's Climate March and the resistance to the Keystone XL pipeline. He's the author of the bestsellers The End of Nature, Earth, with two A's, I'm not sure how to say that, and Deep Economy, among others, and teaches at the Schumann, as the Schumann Distinguished Scholar in Environmental Studies at Middlebury College. Feel free. Strand, Middlebury, keep it going for august institutions. His work has garnered him the Gandhi Prize, the Thomas Merton Prize, and the Wright Livelihood Prize. We were honored to celebrate his novel, Radio Free Vermont, almost two years ago, and I couldn't be more excited to have him back to discuss his urgent and powerful new book with Naomi Klein, who described Falter as a love letter, a plea, a eulogy, and a prayer for our planet and our people. Naomi is an award-winning journalist and New York Times best-selling author. Her books have been translated into over 30 languages. She is the senior correspondent for The Intercept and a Puffin Writing Fellow at Type Media Center, uh, with bylines in such publications as The New York Times, Le Monde, and The Guardian. In September 2018, she was named the inaugural Gloria Steinem Chair in Media, Culture, and Feminist Studies at Rutgers University. And in 2016, she received Australia's prestigious Sydney Peace Prize for, in the words of the jury, inspiring us to stand up locally, nationally, and internationally to demand a new agenda for sharing the planet that respects human rights and equality. Her new book, On Fire, The Burning Case for a Green New Deal, will be released in September. Um, it's tough to calculate the impact of the work these two have done and are doing to confront the problems and possibilities facing humankind in the 21st century, so I won't try. Instead, I hope you'll join me in listening as they discuss this pivotal point in our history. Please join me in welcoming Bill and Naomi to the Strand. <laughs> We're here. Hey, pal. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm not Elizabeth Colbert, which I realize yeah. is on all of the posters around here. So um, sorry to disappoint, but thanks for coming anyway. Um, Bill, congratulations. Friend, can I just say uh, um, thank you? Um, and it's really good for me to get to see uh, friends here, including the, the good people at Holt who published this book and have published all my books for a long time. And you know, you know what book tour is like, but this is definitely the best just to get to um, do this with you. And, you know, Naomi and I, uh, of course, have, uh, I mean, I've admired her work as a writer for uh, ever since she started, but we've also had the great fun of getting to work really closely together on actual non-writing work, um, um, on trying to cause trouble. Um, when, we were, when we were thinking of starting the fight against the Keystone Pipeline, the very, very first people that I called were uh, Naomi and her husband, Ovi, and uh, said, is this a good idea, or are we just going to get in and say, oh, no, go ahead, do this right away. And and oh, and, and, and then we Hi, were... Alberta. There you are. <laughs> and then we... Um, and then we were plotting, talking, plotting one day, six or seven years ago, and hit on this idea of the fossil fuel divestment movement, um, which turned out to be Naomi, a good idea. Eight trillion dollars worth of endowments later, a, 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 a good idea. So there's, I, I have no, I have no closer collaborator in the world and no one that I'd rather be with, talk with, uh, uh, hang out with, mostly cause trouble with. Um, so thank you enormously for all you do in the world, friend. It's your book launch, Bill. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, well, I am so excited, and yes, this risks turning into a love-in. It's always wonderful just to have an excuse to sit and talk with Bill, um, especially on Earth Day. And I want to thank the Strand so much for, for hosting us, all of you for uh, um, coming. Um, there are amazing climate organizers and artists and agitators in this room, and um, and it's a moment, you know. I think this is this is. Um, you know, when I read Bill, I always, I, I, I feel always a mix of emotion. I feel so grateful uh, for Bill's stamina, um, for sticking with us and finding, always finding these new and amazing um, ways to use his tremendous talents as a writer, as a storyteller, um, to tell us this story that I know he wishes so much he didn't have to tell. Um, you know, I. I, I I, it, there is an alternate reality where Bill just gets to write love letters to the natural world. <laughs> it just gets to go all over the place and just love it and, and appreciate it and not write these eulogies for it, as he has been warning us about for, for 30 years. Um, so I want to extend my gratitude to you, Bill, for, for sticking with us. And, and I want to say, I wish that it were otherwise. Mm. Um, and, and I want to ask you a little bit about stamina before, b b before we crack open the book because I think it's it's a question that all of us who are in this struggle for a long time come up against. There are a lot of emotions in this work, right? And when you dig into the research, when you're reading the latest climate science, it's not like you're just, you know, doing any old research. <laughs> um, it's it's scary. So how do you how do you stay in it? How do you not become bitter? How do you keep that desire to reach out to other human beings and, 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 and touch them in the hope of change? Well, so in one sense, I, I mean, I have it easier because I really have been, I mean, this, this is actually the 30th anniversary of the end of nature coming out this year. So, which was the first book about climate change. So I've had longer than all but a few scientists to kind of think about this. And when I was 28 and I wrote that, I was in bad shape for a year or two afterwards, um, um, just sort of thinking through its implications over and over again. At a certain point, like all griefs, one starts to figure out how one's going to sort of move forward with it. And, and so I have. Um, and of course, the thing that made that much easier was sort of halfway through that 30-year stretch when I finally figured out that it was going to be necessary to be uh, more an activist than a writer going forward. I, sometimes I truly kick myself for how long it took me to figure that out. The first 15 years after the writing The End of Nature, being a writer and sometime teacher and things, my, uh, you know, idea about how to proceed was write more books, have more articles, conduct more symposiums, you know, so on. Eventually, the weight of evidence will persuade uh, the powers that be to do the obvious thing and start taking this seriously and getting to work. It took a good 10 or 15 years to figure out that we were um, not in an argument. We'd won the argument. The science was extraordinarily clear. We were in a fight. The fight, as fights always were, was about money and power, not about data and reason. We were getting our butts kicked because the other side, the fossil fuel industry, has more money and more power than any industry in the history of the planet. And so it was going to be necessary to try and figure out how to counterbalance that. And that's why the, you know, the movement building was the thing that has kept me more or less sane. And now we get to sort of see its fruits. You know, it's been 12 or 15 long years of work, and there's lots of people in this room who've engaged in that work, and now we're finally in one of these moments where it's kind of, I mean, we have in this country the Green New Deal 
crew who are mostly veterans of the fossil fuel divestment campaign now you know working on a larger stage and in Europe we have extinction rebellion causing glorious trouble in London and most of all the magnificent Greta Thunberg and her you know now millions of followers around the world leaving school and it opens up all kinds of new work that we can talk about what we got to do next but uh, 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 so that's what, I mean, the, the long answer is just to say, um, having offloaded my angst on other people by writing books, <laughs> um, when it creeps back in, I keep it at bay by, um, by working as hard as I can to try and figure out sort of what comes next, which is why it's so much fun to get to work with you. Well, I want to definitely want to return to this. Um, to the kind of scorecard that you do so well um, of sort of looking at, at the balance of powers. And you know, there have been some big victories, including you know, in New York State, in New York City, uh, recently for Green New Deal-like uh, uh, ambition. And this is one of the exciting things, is that it isn't all about waiting for some you know, breakthrough off in the future. It's about getting started wherever we have leverage, right? So I want to come back to that. But this book, which really is a remarkable book, is, you know, it, it, I think that uh, there, some people might assume that it is e just about climate change because that is what people are used to hearing from you these past couple decades, three decades. Um, but you have, it, you, you, you have explored in previous books before founding 350, um, these deeper economic questions and, um, and questions around technology. And this, I want to zoom out on, on, on the thesis of this book, um, because you draw these very interesting connections between what is happening on a planetary scale with climate um, and what is happening to our very selves with artificial intelligence, with genetic engineering and the specter of designer babies. And I'd love for you to just um, draw out for us what, you, what, what, com what are the commonalities, what are the common elements that you see? What's the story that you see here? So let me say first that there, there's a, about a quarter of this book is devoted to some of these new technologies that are emerging. And to me, they feel, it feels very much like it felt to me when I was trying to write about climate change in 1989. Like, here was a threat that I could feel very profoundly like, but it was, but it was hard yet to get people to sort of understand it because you could, there wasn't yet something you could point to. There wasn't the equivalent of, you know, firestorms and floods and the, all the things that we now can see that make it so evident what climate change is about. So the, the, the reason that these new technologies scare me a good deal is because just as I thought we took the physical stability of the planet for granted, I think we take the, I, I think we're much too sanguine about whether or not human meaning is vulnerable or not. I think we think that, that it's, it has some eternal, uh, power, but I don't think it does. I think if we head down, if we don't figure out how to head off some of these technological changes, then we're going to very quickly be in a place. I mean, if climate change at some sense represented the end of nature, these are things that may represent a kind of end of human nature. Uh, so the example, and the sort of one that's clear, easiest to see at the moment, I think, because it's beginning to actually happen, uh, is human genetic engineering. In October, we produced the first two designer babies on this planet. A Chinese doctor produced a pair of uh, twin girls who had been genetically altered in an embryo. Um, um, and this, this is the beginning, probably, of, unless people figure out how to stop it, slow it down, of uh, something that a lot of people in the sort of 
biotech world have envisioned coming, a world where they're able to create better people by uh, playing with their genome in embryo. And first thing to be said is, just in passing, it's not necessary. We, we, people who are at risk of genetic illness, we already have ways to uh, uh, prevent that transmission. Um, this is work that's necessary if you want to improve people, and people devoutly do. Uh, uh, so it's not hard to imagine, in fact, the people who are doing this work often write about it, a scenario where uh, you know, in a few years, you'll be able to go into the clinic, pull out your credit card, and uh, get the sort of list of traits to the degree that we can manipulate them that you want. Maybe a, a change in the serotonin level of your child, since we already know a lot about what genes regulate that, um, um, to make them more optimistic and happy. That raises deep questions about human meaning, like you turn 13 and you wake up one day feeling giddy and happy about the world and you don't know whether it's because something's happened to make you feel giddy and, or because it's sort of your spec kicking in. But it also raises deep questions to go to the point you were making about technology and, and uh, obsolescence. I mean, think about what happens next when you go back three or four years later for your second child in the clinic. Um, I mean, the way that we all familiar with the way that technology works, it improves with each passing year. So your credit card now buys you a better set of upgrades, which is great, except now, what was your first child? Your first child was, you know, Windows 2000, you know, iPhone 6, you know, whatever, uh, uh, moored on a kind of island of technological obsolescence like everybody who will come afterwards. These are the kind of, uh, these are the kind of risks that we take for no particularly good reason, except that, in large measure, A, the technology is kind of interesting, and B, someone can clearly figure out a way to make a lot of money from it going forward. But is uh, it, I mean, is there a, is there a, is there a thread connecting yeah, that's, the comp, like You the asked a good question, and I got lost in my own. <laughs> there is a thread connecting it all, or at least I think there is. Um, uh, a large part of the book is about, begins with the question of why didn't we respond to climate change? And one of the answers to that, maybe the biggest answer, is that uh, the fossil fuel industry made a point of making sure we never would. Uh, they mounted a huge propaganda campaign and so on to keep us stymied. How did they manage to convince themselves that that was a uh, reasonable thing to do. It had a lot to do with the fact that in the last 30 years, as you've written about beautifully, we've turned into a world that forsook human solidarity in, uh, uh, in, in the effort to, um, well, in a kind of libertarian fantasy uh, that markets solved all problems, that greed was the best possible motivating force in the world, that so on and so forth. Um, that libertarianism that you know is the hallmark of, say, the Koch brothers, who are the single biggest reason that we didn't take climate change seriously, is also the hallmark of Silicon Valley at the moment. The one icon that passes between those very disparate worlds of like old school tycoons and new school. The one person that they, that, 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 who's, that works in both places is Ayn Rand. Um, um, her worldview and her name is, you know, golden in the Trump administration and it's, you know, golden at, at you name it, you know, big tech firm that you want to. And, that's been the most dangerous and poisonous set of ideas that it's possible to imagine. Against it, we somehow have to figure out ways to posit human solidarity or love, mm -hmm. if you want to call it that, or, or, or whatever, because that's the thing now. And, 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 and the but other also proof like of it. The, those, the, 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 that, that 
quest for the perfect child, right? Like, I mean, I think we think of it as this just kind of like rich people who just, you know, are just Trying endless to get their kids consumers. into college, yeah. right? Yeah. But, but I think it's connected to the world these people created, right? Because it is so hyper-competitive and so precarious. And that, so hyper-individualist yeah. right. at So all any times. edge you can get, of course you have to take, because yes. people aren't just in this constant state of panic. And um, But I also feel like there's a part, something going on where I think science fiction has failed us to some extent. Not all science fiction, but like this future has been foretold so many times that in some ways when it actually happens, it feels like a cliche. Like, oh, of course we're going to have designer babies. Oh, and of course we're going to have environmental apocalypse too, right? We've seen that same movie over and over and over again. Um, and. I mean, your last book was fiction, and I think <laughs> partly because, like, well, if, if, if Ayn Rand teaches us anything, it's the power of fiction. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but, yeah. I mean, what do, do the does, do the sci-fi authors have something? <laughs> well, so one of the most interesting things about for? about sci-fi. I mean, about science fiction over the last while is that <laughs> is that as you say, it's done a terrific job of predicting much of what's going to happen and it's you know far from the kind of science fiction of my youth which was kind of Roy Rogers in space you know kind of fun whatever it's the most dystopian <coughs> part of the whole bookstore you know mm -hmm. because it's the only place where people have had to grapple imaginatively with the problem of a power that's so much larger than h human beings uh, that it just overwhelms them, you know? I mean, and, and so had to grapple imaginatively with these emerging things, and that's why it's so, so bleak most of the time. Um, um, and our job is to just the opposite, to figure out how to make a real concerted defense of the human and the human scale, which is, you know, not the easiest thing to do right at the moment. I mean, we're in a Trumpian, nasty moment when it's there, 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 it's sort of possible. I mean, it's there, there are moments when one can't help but say, oh, you know, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if humans disappeared and <coughs> something else took over or whatever. But one of the things, reasons I wrote the book was to try and say something that I, that I deeply believe, which is that, you know, these are things we should at least note and fight, not just allow to sort of, and, and it's the thing that I'm now, that the one thing that I'm completely happy about with climate change. I became very worried, almost obsessively worried 15 years ago, that we were just gonna go over this cliff without ever even really noticing it, without putting up a fight, without figuring out how to do more than tell each other to change our light bulbs or whatever. And that's not gonna happen now. I mean, in climate, we've all built a movement. It's kicking and screaming. We may lose, but we're not going to lose quietly. And there's something dignified about that. And for whatever yeah. reason, that seems important to me. Yeah, and I, I mean, the, the thing that is so frightening and important about this, and tantalizing about this moment, right, is that is that we are just so damn close to the edge and over it in so many, over the edge in so many ways. I mean, you were filming in the Arctic a few months ago and came back pretty shaken, um, having seen for yourself just the <laughs> speed with which the ice shelf was disappearing. But the other thing that is crumbling um, is that ideology that has been the big single yep. stumbling block yep. to our ability to respond collectively to the ultimate collective crisis, right? So, um, you know, it is you know, it is a zombie ideology. It has been a zombie ideology since 2008. And now, at some lag, we actually have a, we have political figures stepping forward and actually talking about real alternatives. Right. In part because, as you've written so well over the years, the same, this same kind of hyper-individualism, the other thing that it produced and the other hallmark of our time, the other thing that's as statistically anomalous as the heat in the, you know, record heat, is the insane levels of inequality that it produced. And some combination of all these things is producing a really powerful reaction. But also, 
Trump and right. also reaction on yeah, all sides, yeah. like craziness er erupting. I, I mean, I have enough faith in us to think that uh, we will respond pretty well. Like you can see the reaction to inequality finally emerging. You know, that's what. Bernie and Elizabeth Warren, and that, that's what that means, and the same around the world. The thing that scares me is that both of these things that I'm writing about, uh, uh, climate and this sort of onrushing technological hubris, are both happening really fast. And our political system is not geared at the moment to deal with things that happen fast. And that's the part that terrifies me because once you're past a certain, once you've crossed the Rubicon on these things, I mean, no one has a plan for refreezing the Arctic once it's Well, they melted. do, and they're really scary. Yeah. yeah. Right. You don't want to know about the plan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, let's um, let's I, talk about. I want to interrupt yeah. just to put okay. in an advertisement for oh. you, you guys, the new video that you and because we're talking about reaction and home stuff. The the video that Avi and Naomi and Alexandria Ocasio Cortez and Molly Crabapple, and Molly Crabapple mm -hmm. released last week about the Green New Deal. If you haven't seen it, is worth searching out when you get home. And. Uh, because it's the perfect example of this kind of, yeah. You know, what is it? How do you what do you search for? A message from the future mm -hmm. with Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. A message from the future. Uh, it's the perfect <clears throat> example of this kind of hopeful, strong, spirited response that we that will win on so many. I mean, uh, you, but God, we need to we need to do it fast. The level of urgency at this point is, I mean. So one of the problems with having written the first book about all this is that there's sometimes an almost irresistible tendency, temptation to say, oh, if only you'd listen to me when, you know? Because 30 years ago, there were lots of relatively simple things that would have made rel quite a huge difference in our trajectory. Now there aren't, there's nothing simple left, you know. We're now having wasted 30 years, we're now at the place where Green New Deal scale solutions are the only ones even worth talking about because they're the only ones that, you know, that add up to anything like what the physics requires. That's the, the one difference between a problem like inequality and a problem like climate change is that the first one, people suffer enormously if you don't address it but it doesn't make it impossible to address when you finally do get around to it, you know? Um, um, this one, the climate, it does. You're past the line and that's that, so. And we, I mean, we are certainly hearing that existential urgency from the, particularly from young people. And we've been hearing it from the global south for yep. a long time, right? Yep. I mean, you, you and I have been at these UN climate summits where then there, when there are these harrowing moments, like it, I think it was 20, 2014. Well, when was Typhoon Haiyan? No, it yep. was it, when, and Yebs Sano, the, the, Philippines. the climate negotiator from the Philippines, goes to the mic, and at that very moment, the Philippines is being pummeled by Typhoon Haiyan. He doesn't know where his own the family is. The highest wind speed we've yeah. ever recorded on planet Earth. Yeah. And he just breaks down, you know, and cries and and says, you know, please do something. And you 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 know, then there there are those moments like when Kathy Jetner Jenner, you know, brings her nine month old baby up to the podium at the UN in here in New York and reads this incredible poem about the Marshall Islands disappearing and says, you know, we're not drowning, baby. And there are these moments where like it becomes real, the existential nature. But this is where it all intersects because it is black and brown people in the global south who've been raising the alarm and saying this is an existential crisis. Now we have a whole generation bringing that voice. And, you know, we can, t I mean, you, we can talk about whether it took a girl in Sweden who looks a little bit like Heidi, <laughs> um, who is absolutely remarkable and, you know, my personal hero, to, for people to hear what people from the global south have been saying for so long. 
but that sense of existential urgency is now ricocheting around the yep. world, right? Um, so how does this moment feel to you when you see, you know, I, like I feel like for so long, ch children have been used as rhetorical devices yeah. in the climate <laughs> crisis, right? Children, grandchildren, the next generation. But it wasn't like actual children going, screw you guys, right? And that is what is happening now. So Greta went to, my favorite moment of the year was Greta went to Davos with, you know, the 1,400 masters of the universe who'd flown in on their private planes. And she, she, said, she said, you know, you guys won't, can't even describe the scale of the problem accurately. You make children do that for you too, you know? And it was a, it was a, yeah. and you're right that this is a, you know, understanding that, that, that was clear, it has been clear now for some years in much of the world. This book is dedicated to our old colleague, Kareti Tilmalu who died much too early a couple of years ago, who was the greatest organizer in the South Pacific on these issues, who led the Pacific climate warriors and who have been done the most, some of the most remarkable uh, organizing that there's been about climate change because the nations on which they live will not exist by the end of the century. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, we'll do everything possible we can to make that not come true, but it's at this point uh, a, a pretty near certainty that, that if you're two or three meters above sea level, you're not going to make it out of the 21st century in, in good shape. Um, um, so, so what the moment feels like is, uh, you know, we'll find out soon whether the big brain was a good adaptation or not, you know? Um, um, it clearly can get us in a lot of trouble. And I think the real question is how large a heart is it connected to? Can we get out of this trouble? It requires, I mean, I, you, you, you say what you think, but to me it's never been clearer that what it requires is numbers at mm -hmm. this point. That, that, you know, there's a movement framework there and it's yeah. good and building and but we need you know where there are a, a few million people now we need 10 million people we're here on the i've been thinking about this a lot because today's the 49th anniversary of earth day earth day was important mostly because 20 million americans were in the streets. So 10% of the yeah. then population of America. There's probably never been a day in America with this higher percentage of the population out engaged in political protest. And what do you know, it worked. I mean, in the next four years, the, the zeitgeist had shifted so dramatically that Richard Nixon, who had not an environmental bone in his body, signed every piece of legislation on which we now depend, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, Endangered Species Act. Which is also a reminder that when ch change tips, it can tip fast. Very fast. You know? Um, because this is what we hear about the Green New Deal. It's too much. It's too fast. And then you look at this tsunami of legislation under Richard Nixon, right? So Activists it, at th on these kind of on these kind of huge questions, what activists play for is not a piece of legislation, it's a change in the zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. A change in people's perception of what is normal and natural and obvious. And when you win that, then the rest follows. So the last example of this was the very rapid and almost unbelievable for those of us of a certain age, sea change around the idea of gay marriage. I'm plenty old enough to remember when people didn't even raise it as a possibility because it was so obviously preposterous. Five years ago, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton and people were still against it because it didn't, and then boom, you know, great organizing produced. A, and this is harder because no one made a trillion dollars a year being a bigot, you know. Um, people do make a trillion dollars a year selling each other hydrocarbons. So the, this will be, but the, but the theory is the same. That's what we need to mm -hmm. trigger. And we've triggered it a little, mm -hmm. but we need to trigger it a lot and fast. Yeah. Yeah, and I think what's exciting about a new a Green New Deal framework is that it is so intersectional. It weaves together all of all every issue can find itself in it, and the ones that are left out can get themselves in it. And um, and so 
it isn't just one movement. It is really a framework that can knit well, together. Well, it very much draws on the work that you guys were doing around this LEAP manifesto. And what the climate and justice movement has been doing for so long. And, and so, but I mean, the difference is not that this is a new idea. It's that there are people that it in power. people's <laughs> imagination. Yeah. Yes. I mean, and then it seems like it might actually be able yes. to happen. And that is really energizing. But there's a lot more work that needs to happen to, to, you know, to, to get that leverage that you're describing because you think about what won the old New Deal, you know, and the, this was a period where people were shutting down cities, you know, and having sit-down strikes and, you know, shutting down the ports and just, you know, and FDR was able to say, this is a compromise. The alternative is revolution. These folks are crazy, you know? <laughs> um, so we always have to <laughs> remember that, you know, this is not about just watching the Democrats and sort of, you know, thinking about which, which candidate is going to be the one most likely to hand this down from on high. That's not you know the way this is going to work. One thing that I just realized that I, that that is maybe a useful connection around these you know themes of your book and and this threat of designer babies and and um, and this kind of trend towards homogenization and dehumanization that is happening in tech. Um, you think about Greta. Mm. Right. I mean, Greta is proudly on the autism spectrum, right? Um, and she is not the kind of baby that people would have designed, right? But here she is changing the world um, and saying, you know, it is difference that is our strength and really embodying that so profoundly. And in her case, the, the difference is she's undistractable. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, you know, just on there all the time, and it's yeah, it's a very that's a beautiful. I hadn't mm -hmm. thought of it in quite that way, and it's a beautiful way to think about it. <laughs> um, Amen. So I know that all of you have questions for Bill. So or Naomi. Uh, um, so is it a good time to open it up? Yeah. If yeah. you want to raise your hand, I will do my best to bring you the mic, short of flinging it at you. I'll be right there. Hi, I'm a member of NYU Divest. Thanks, Bill. Hey. hey. <laughs> um, but this overlap of tech and um, climate change is interesting when you have people talking about um, sulfur spewing technologies or carbon sucking technologies like David Wallace Wells and the new New York Mag, or sort of this domination of nature versus solutions like soil carbon sequestration. Where do you see those overlapping, and do you talk about it in your book? Sure, I do, some, and, and happily Naomi has thought a lot about uh, geoengineering too. Let me just say my, I mean, I, I'm not in any sense uh, uh, anti-technology. The end of this book is a, uh, the last section is a kind of uh, missive to the two great technologies, it seems to me, from the 20th century that, that might give us a chance at saving ourselves. One is the solar panel. Uh, uh, which is technology, technology. And the other is the invention of kind of nonviolent movements in the 20th century, the kind of work that the suffragettes and Gandhi and King and, and so many others did uh, to give us a kind of tool to allow the, the many to stand up to the few, you know, uh, to the powerful. Um, but so I think that the technological answer is uh, mostly super obvious. It's that we replace coal and gas and oil with sun and wind, and since the price of a solar panel has fallen 90% in the last decade, and it's now the cheapest way to generate electrons around the world, since wind is the other cheapest way, uh, uh, then that's clearly what we should be doing. And the effort to, um, to uh, figure out some like technological workaround where you pour a lot of sulfur into the air instead so you can keep doing what you're doing just strikes me as completely nuts. Um, I, you know, I used to, when I lived in New York as a young man, I ran a homeless shelter in the basement of my church. So I spent a lot of it, got to be very good friends with some quite serious junkies, you know. Uh, uh, um, and as much as I liked them, they had a kind of, uh, often had a kind of logical uh, 
a sort of flaw in there, think some, that some deus ex machina would emerge to prevent them from having to deal with the very obvious fact of their life, which that's, that they were junkies and it was wrecking their life. Well, f deciding that you're going to spew sulfur into the atmosphere is a method for fossil fuel junkies to avoid having to make serious and obvious changes. And the only reason you do it is if you happen to own a huge coal deposit someplace that you really wanted to be able to dig up and burn. Uh, well, fact, you, you know a lot about geoengineering. Well, unfortunately, I have spent a fair bit of time with the would-be geoengineers. And, you know, it is, it's not by happenstance that, it, it, that this has been a project that's been underwritten by people like Richard ba Branson, you know, who owns an airline, and Bill Gates, you know, who it has profited more than, you know, maybe anyone other than two other people on this planet from this particular economic model. So it is, you know, it's sort of, it's asking the question, you know, how do we respond to this to this massive crisis in a way that d does as little as possible to disrupt the status quo that is working so incredibly well for me, right? <laughs> um, whereas if you turn it upside down, and I think what's powerful about the whole climate justice framework is that it starts from the assumption that this economic model actually isn't working for the vast majority of people, right? So it isn't afraid of deep change, because actually we need change on all kinds of different fronts, right? Um, but you know, speaking of technologies, another really great technology is the tree, because mm -hmm. um, we actually do need to draw down carbon, and um, and and there's great research now that's showing us that we can really effectively and really rapidly draw down carbon, um, you know, th through reforestation and you know wetland rehabilitation and all kinds of um, habitat rehabilitation so that we are you know, rewilding the world um, and fighting extinction at the same time as we're fighting climate change. And you know, one, of the th one of the really great models that we can look to for this is the, the old New Deal, you know, which yep. is flawed in lots of ways, but started the Civilian Conservation Corps that hired two million poor kids from cities to go plant two and a half billion trees, which is half the number of trees that have ever been planted in this country, right? And they were doing it because of the Dust Bowl, they were doing it because of, um, you know, they had a, they had a, a forest management problem. Um, but we need to do it to fight climate change, and it is possible to do. Um, and, you know, I, I think it, it's, it just seems that it is, you know, what, what worries me most about geoengineering <coughs> is that it would be implemented within our current system. The whole point of it is to protect the current system. And so when you dig into the research, the really, really scary thing is that the impacts of it are uneven, unevenly distributed. So if you do solar radiation management, manage the sun, right, spray sulfur into the atmosphere, what you're trying to do is you're trying to imitate a high altitude volcano. And what we know from previous high altitude volcanoes is that they interfere with the Asian summer monsoons. They move right. the monsoon off the subcontinent. Yeah. So you're talking about playing with the food supply and water supply of billions of people, right? And so how hard is it to imagine a world where, you know, a Trump-like figure decides to, you know, fight a drought in Iowa by pulling the trigger on something like this? And then you have this, you, you ha we have a crisis that already is so in incredibly unequally distributed, where the people who've done the least to create it are already bearing the burden. And we can imagine a scenario so easily where the response to it actually massively deepens those inequalities. So, you know, I think it is beyond dangerous. I think it is potentially genocidal. It is terrifying. Um, and, you know, we need to be really, really firm about it. One of the, one of the ways to get a sense of what um, our betters think about the the planet that they're on. This book actually ends in Cape Canaveral, um, uh, watching one of Elon Musk's rockets go off. The one thing that, beyond their affection for Ayn Rand, that <laughs> unites the richest 10, 15 richest people on Earth is they all seem incredibly eager to leave. You know, um, <laughs> they're all trying to build rockets so they can take off, which granted m might not be the worst thing in the entire world were it to happen. Um, um, but, but that's, you know, that's literally where 
the excess billions of, you know, that, that are generating are now, a lot of them are going, you know? Um, 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 and it's a remarkable reminder that they've decided that the planet that we live on is some combination of doomed and, and not worth saving when just, when you'll, as you said, I would, you know, given my druthers, I would just write love letters to the natural world. It is worth remembering that the least hospitable square inch of planet Earth, you know, the top of some mountain, the middle of the Sahara Desert, is a thousand times more hospitable than any other place we've ever come close to finding any place else in the, the world. Um, the, the fact that we treat so cavalierly both our planet and increasingly our role as human beings is uh, some sign of some, something that's gone seriously wrong in our uh, you know, understanding of who we are, I think. Um, okay, yeah. Oh, sorry, we, oh, hey Josh. Okay, you can go Josh and then you. Jo oh, Josh. Oh, it's Josh. Hi, it's me. It's Josh Fox, hi, everyone, Josh hey. Josh Fox, hello. So, <laughs> I, I've been thinking a lot about two things rather intensely. One is the border crisis and the other is climate reparations. Because no even in our best case scenario, where we get everything we want in the Green New Deal, we're still gonna have enormous disruptions. Mm -hmm. And an enormous amount of people, maybe even a billion people, trying to find a new home, a lot of which are coming to the global north. Can you talk a little bit about the intersection of the xenophobia and racism that we're seeing around the border wall and climate change, sure. and the idea of the, the, the global north's debt to people in the, in the Absolutely. Global Thanks, Josh. That's a good question, Josh, and thank you very much for your work over the years, which has been pretty key. Um, look, <laughs> everybody watched, uh, I mean, we have a pretty good understanding now that one of the key triggers of what happened in Syria was the deepest drought in the history of the Fertile Crescent, which drove a million farmers off their land and into the cities and helped spark this civil war in an already brutal and unstable country. So a million people left Syria headed for Europe, and that was enough to completely discombobulate the politics of Western Europe. Somewhat less than a million people have left the highlands of Guatemala and Honduras and El Salvador, fleeing to some degree gang violence and to a large degree, as a good story in the Times 10 days ago made clear, uh, the deep and ongoing drought in that part of the world. Uh, Central America is one of the few places on Earth with big oceans on both sides, and so the fact that the oceans are heating faster than land is tending to cause real climatic disruptions there before other places. Um, if, a billion, if, if a million people can that completely screw up the politics and culture of, of Western Europe, uh, regressing places in many ways, in ways that we, I, I think, didn't even realize were possible. If it can have that same effect to a large degree on this country, because clearly a key reason we got Trump has something to do with fear of I I immigration. Um, then try to imagine the UN low estimate for climate refugees by the middle to latter part of the century is 200 million, and the high estimate, as Josh said, is a billion. So try to imagine what kind of world that is, what it means in terms of war and peace, in terms of development, in terms of all the things that one cares about. Um, that's one of the reasons why it's so key to try and slow down the heating of the planet, because people just literally have no alternative. They starve or they move. Those are the two choices they have. And Naomi has written and thought a lot about this question of r reparations. Talk a little bit about, I mean, I mean, uh, look, a lot of this book is, uh, there's a good 50 pages that's a kind of trying to lay out the story of precisely how the oil companies came to screw up our, our ability to deal with this. But talk about what they, I mean, what we should be taking from them. 
Yeah. I mean, that's, it's a, that's a good point, too. I mean, the reparations are owed um, from the, by the people most responsible to the people least responsible. Um, and I think we've tended to think of that purely in national terms, and that there is a lot of truth to that, right? I mean, the, 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 this is a country that is the world's largest historical emitter. Um, y you know, we're the countries that have been burning fossil fuels for hundreds of years owe something to the people who have tiny carbon footprints and are being displaced from their lands and are owed adaptation funds, you know, uh, um, and uh, uh, in my opinion, are owed full rights in coming to the country, are owed a welcome, you know, are owed an apology, right? Um, are, and, and, and so I, I think that, um, I think it is a weakness of the current Gr Green New Deal resolution that it doesn't talk about migration, because it isn't just, it isn't just, that's not the only thing we owe. I mean, you go to Houston, New Orleans, any, 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 any city that's been pummeled by a hurricane, who do you think is cleaning up? Mm. You know, and then getting deported mm. afterwards, after they've cleaned up and rebuilt people's homes. Um, so we, migration has to be at the center of this debate. And in my opinion, climate, like where we're at right now is about what kind of human beings we want to be, right? And this is the central question of, uh, of Bill's book, is you know, the question of what does it mean to be human, right? Um, and, and how that is slipping away. And that is the central question as we enter these stormy times that, that we've already entered, right? And as we, lo we are losing our humanity, we are seeing it in all kinds of ways. It's not by happenstance that we're seeing Europe, Australia, the United States fortressing their borders and, and having this rising white supremacist violence um, at the very moment that climate change is biting. Whether or not these guys deny climate change or not, they all know it's happening. They all know it's happening and they all know more people are coming. And so whenever you have a moment like that, you're faced with this question, right? I mean, it, it, it is gonna be a, a future where there is more scarcity. So are we gonna share or are we gonna hoard? That's the core question facing us as humans, right? And we have one answer at the border and we have one answer in Trump, but I don't think the rest of us have given a full-throated enough counter answer to that. Um, and that's what I think this moment's about. You had a question over there. Was, yeah. oh. Hello, my name's Sophia. I actually just committed to Middlebury class of 2023. Mm, right. So. Um, <laughs> So um, when looking at a system that is so loath to change and uh, so entrenched in capitalism and uh, the idea of profiting off of the destruction of our earth, uh, to what extent can we work within that system and try and pass torturously slow legislation? And to what extent do we have to take direct action and work against or even to break that system, whether that be like movements like Water's Life and, uh, and no DAPL? or valve turners or valve turners or the likes. So Naomi answered Ray, I mean answered this question as well as it's ever going to be answered in this changes everything in in a lot of ways. Um, um, you can look at it two ways. I mean one way is we have to change everything before we can change anything and the other is that in the process of changing the things that we have to change because we are in a absolute physical crisis, then maybe we can make some of the changes. That, I'm, I'm a less systematic thinker than Naomi. Um, so for me, trajectories are the most important thing, sort of trying to get going in more or less the right direction. One of the things that strikes me as a real opportunity right now is we have to put up solar panels and wind turbines because physics requires it. It's a matter of survival. In the process of doing that, if we do it with any intelligence at all, we will, to one degree or another, rebalance some of the things that are worst about the power. I mean, look, an astonishing percentage of the people who hold too much sway in our world do it because they happen to sit on top of the small piles of coal and gas and oil. I mean, the Koch brothers are not the Koch brothers because they have some great insight about the world that they've, you know, I mean, they're the Koch brothers because they 
are the biggest oil and gas barons in North America, so they have a spare hundred billion dollars with which to, you know, uh, live out their absurd libertarian fantasies and impose them on all the rest of us. They'll be rich people in a solar world, but there won't be Koch brothers rich people for the simple reason that once you get this panel up on the roof, the sun comes for free, which, by the way, is the reason that Exxon and everybody hate it so much. You know, it's for them, that's the stupidest business model anybody ever thought of. So to me, the reason, you know, when we fight hard for change, we should be thinking constantly about how to make that change work in as many ways as we can. And that's why the Green New Deal is so interesting, right? It doesn't actually, you know, require, I mean, it's something that's achievable and imaginable more or less within the world that currently exists, but its adoption, like the New Deal in the first place, would fundamentally change that world in a lot of ways. The simple fact that it require, you have to have a lot of human labor in order to make this energy transition is the reason that the Green New Deal requires a federal job guarantee in order to, you know, as part of its thing. Well, a federal job guarantee would help usher in a very different America than the one that we've gotten used to where people are endlessly played against each other in this kind of carnival of scarcity and and so on so the 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 power of the moment is precisely the fact that faced with a physical crisis we can't or, or maybe we can but we'd be very ill advised to just try and keep kind of just going on as we've been going on I said before, and I want to say this before I forget, you know, one of the things that uh, Greta and people have begun to call for is for adults to back them up. Keep a good eye open over the next few weeks because we're going to be issuing a call of some kind for adult climate strikes, okay? In the same way that people have disrupted education as usual, it's time to disrupt business as usual, precisely because it's business as usual that's literally the thing that's killing us. Just the fact that we get up every morning and keep doing as a society the same things we did the day before, that's literally the name of the problem that we're in and we have to figure out how to disrupt it. Yeah, and, and, and the other, I think, benefit of that is, is it starts to close this burden of cognitive dissonance that people have been living with, of sort of feeling the emergency and then, you know, going out on the streets and just seeing everybody just shopping as usual and, you know, working as usual. And, 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 and that's kind of soul destroying. And once you sort of are with groups of other people saying, no, it's an emergency, it actually just changed things. Um, you had a question over there? Yeah, I, I, don't, I think I can talk about big fan. Um, uh, thinking about anger and um, the way AOC is a beautiful expressor of anger. Um, uh, you mentioned Gandhi, and I met Gandhi's grandson the other night on a conference who's 85 years old and wrote a book called The Gift of Anger, and it's just coming out. And I was wondering if you could speak, both of you, but Naomi, I mean, I've read you for, for quite some time and written about your work and, and feel that you have taught me how to be angry in a, in a really good way, you know, where it's, <laughs> you know. Um, but I would love for you to, both of you to speak about that concept of um, righteous anger and how to express it, because I think a little bit of our problem on the left is that we, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't call myself on the left, but I'm perhaps independent and in the middle and go way left. But too much politeness and too much confusion about our own right to demand what we have a right to demand. Bill and I are both very calm, you know. Um, I'm, a Cana I'm Canadian, so I'm kind of polite as well. I try, n I try not to be. Um, I think I'm less polite when I write than when you meet me in person. <laughs> um, I mean, what I will say is that I think there's a lot of emotions. I mean, anger is one of them. Grief is another one. Love is another one. But they're big emotions. And what I think 
is part of the cognitive dissonance, is when we are talking about something with such high stakes. And this is something that Bill and I have talked about privately. Um, and I think it's, it's tough to be angry as a woman in public and to figure out how to do that or, 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 or to be grief struck. But I do feel like for me, the way I navigate the world, I, 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 you know, I have learned to be very calm. And as a, you know, a woman in fairly like male dominated spaces a lot of the time, writing about economics and you know, um, political history, I, I sort of learned those skills. And I actually don't feel like they serve me very well when it comes to climate communications. I think part of what is breaking through right now with young people in the streets is that they're bringing their full emotions. They're bringing their grief. They're bringing their rage. They're bringing their love of nature. Um, and 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 that, that pierces through that sort of jarring problem of you know somebody's telling you, um, you know, we're facing this existential risk, but they, God, they seem awfully calm about it and not too <laughs> concerned, right? Um, so I don't know exactly what the answer is. I mean, for me, as a kind of public speaker, I don't, I'm, I'm not that person. I try to do it in my writing, because that's where I'm more comfortable. You know, we try to do it in film. Um, at, and you know, I'm working on it, you know? What can I say? I'm working on it. I'm doing all kinds of things. <laughs> I, I'm by nature not the slightest bit. I mean, I'm a you know Methodist Sunday school teacher. I you know as, but I've my my solution to this problem over the years has been has had everything to do with the oil companies. Mm -hmm. um, um, that's for me what took it from this sort of. I think way that I must have conceived it at one time as like a problem of, you know, humans and human nature and why aren't we, you know, to understanding that there were actual people, actual institutions who were doing everything they could to preserve their business model even at the cost of breaking the planet. And that's, that's not in the slightest hyperbole. We now understand from great investigative reporting that these guys knew everything there was to know about climate in the 1980s and spent 30 years telling the most consequential lie in human history over and over and over again. So there are days when, I mean, I know too much about the science of climate change. And I, there are days when I'll get up and read something in the paper. There was a paper last week in, uh, I don't know, Nature Geophysical Letters or something that pointed out that new measurements were showing that uh, uh, permafrost was emitting nitrous oxide, a truly hideous greenhouse gas, at a rate 12 times higher than we had previously thought. Those are the kind of days when I'm just like, I, 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 I don't know whether we're going to get out of this or not. And my way of, I think, of getting up on those days and going to work is just reminding myself that even if we're not going to save the planet, it's uh, reward enough to make life more difficult for Exxon, you know, <laughs> along the way. There's got to be some days when that's all that there is that, you know, you have to go on. And it's a good thing to, to go on. I mean, one thing I will say is that as we think about how to build movements that sustain people, we have to make sure to allow space for people to feel the full range of emotions that... Including that, that, hope. Yes, including hope, including hope, yes, and joy and love and grief and rage, um, yes, all of it. we got time for one more. You pick. Yeah, I, I just want to ask about communication. I, I worry a little bit about how to reach the, the majority that you say we need to get into the streets and how to reach the people that are, they're working two jobs and, and three jobs and, and they don't have time. You know, how, how do we, or what work is being done? I'm sure so, that there is a lot of work being done on that score, but so yeah. The best work, this is the, just the right question and the right question on which to end, and thank you for it. The best work on that score is being done by Mother Nature, who is you know, now repeatedly hitting us upside the head with a two by four to remind us 
exactly the folly that we've gone in. And it's working. The polling data is extraordinarily clear at this point that even Americans, who were the only place in the world where climate denial was a serious issue, are now over that. We're at about 75% of people who understand what's going on and understand more or less. They may not quite get just how urgent it is, but they have some pretty good sense of the problem. So the question, the real question is, how do you take that 75%? Don't worry about the other 25%. They've, if you've spent the last 30 years marinating in Rush Limbaugh, then you're not gonna pick up on this. Okay? I mean, it's just, it's just, it's too much ideological discomfort for any person to manage. And, and it's, one should just sort of think kindly and sadly in some ways of that. The, the question is how do you get some reasonable percentage of that 75% actually at work? What we know about political movements, and there's been a lot of work, the best, there's a woman named Erica Chenoweth who's done some of the best political science on this in recent years. From hundreds of examples over the last 75 years, our suspicion is that when you can get three and a half, four percent of people really engaged in a movement, that's actually usually enough to win. A way of thinking about it is apathy cuts both ways, right? Like we had to work, Naomi and I and others, super hard to get this divestment movement going. Um, and, th and then, you know, wonderfully people at NYU and a thousand other places joined in and, and did it. And it's always huge work, but it's not like when at NYU they were doing, the one thing they didn't have to worry about at NYU was that there was gonna be like a huge pro Exxon invest more in fossil fuels rally, you know, the next day after they did their thing. Uh, apathy cuts both ways, so if we get people engaged in, I mean, that's why that Earth Day thing is so important. 10% of the population was clearly enough to change the zeitgeist, to change the flavor of the world. And that's what we're playing for now. So, I, I mean, the real answer to this question is just, uh, you know, st people need to stop thinking that there's probably some kind of individual solutions to these questions. By far the most important thing an individual can do is not change their light bulb, not, I mean, those are all good things, you know, but we're not gonna solve this one vegan meal, one Prius, one whatever at a time. Individuals need to become slightly less individual and join together with people in movements large enough to matter, which is why, you know, when the call goes out, and it will in a few weeks, we're gonna need everybody engaged, and we're gonna need everything to, I mean, we're gonna need people, even the good people selling books at the Strand, to be walking off the job for a day sometime <laughs> next fall, and, and, and building that kind of irresistible momentum. And we do have to stop, in part because, I mean, I'm gonna sign books for a little while, but Naomi and I are, as part of this, are. Any minute supposed to be on uh, uh, via our cell phone. T t tonight they're having a huge launch for the uh, Green New Deal campaign in the Midwest, and there's apparently many thousands of people in a theater there, uh, uh, and we're gonna talk to them a little bit just for a minute uh, to try and spread this same news precisely in the parts of the country you know, where, where we really need to be digging in and getting work done. So I just, I mean, I, the, the, for me, book tour is usually just a kind of excuse for more organizing, and I'm really grateful to you all for, I know that people here have played a huge role in this fight, and we're gonna call on you to play even more of a role going forward. So thank you, is what I would say. And thank you, Bill. Thank you for everything you've done for our movement. We love you. And it's a wonderful book, everybody.